and um, get working on submitting, okay? All right, so then after you submit that, um, you have that submit, you know, the first answer is submitted, the question two will appear after that 30 minutes is up and take the 15 minutes of the 20 minutes on the timer and craft your response to that and then use that last five minutes to submit your response. And if you feel like, you know, I don't feel like anyone's going to think they're finishing early, but if, if you're finished, submit, you know, don't, you don't have to wait. Um, and we would encourage you to make sure your answers get submitted. Okay. These are the five things you've hopefully already done. Most of them, um, make sure you practiced with the demo. The link has been sent out previously, um, today. And I'm, you know, gather what you need today. You know, I wouldn't have to worry about that tomorrow. You should have your e-ticket. You should have received that yesterday, either through your email, if you've been receiving their emails, or go into your My AP account and it should be there. But make sure you've located that today because you need your AP number. And we're gonna make some suggestions about what you need to do with that number in just a minute. Okay, um, when you're submitting a response, there's three ways to do it. We've gone over this before, but just a highlights of this. You know, a lot of web browsers are supported. Um, Chrome is suggested, you know, Firefox, um, Edge. One thing you cannot use is Internet Explorer. So make sure you are aware of that if you haven't heard that previously. Um, I have, and when you go into the um, some tips that Matt Dean has sent out to teachers today, there seems to be some issues with this copy and paste with, and I think, um, Mr. Elegante referred to that in a previous um, lesson, but with the formatting or something, you know, I've suggested to my own students that if they're typing, that, you know, there are several ways that they can, they could use a Word doc, a docx, Google doc, but you need to save it as a Word document or as a PDF, PDFs can be attached. Um, but only for question one, you can only attach one document. So be, be aware of that if you're attaching a document or if you're taking photos of handwritten work, you will have to attach those. If you have more than one photo for question one or question two, you would have to attach those individually. All right. Now there is an option and we discussed this, um, last time that you could send the photos as one PDF, like put, if you had two or three photos, it could be um, put as a one PDF, but it would have to be attached as this type to response. Okay. So that was kind of a newer thing that came out a little bit later. So I definitely recommend this option two or three. Um, I just, you know, you're, it's a little bit makes you nervous doing this kind of thing anyway. I don't want you to worry about if a format of how you type something would change with copy and pasting. Okay, so I suggest get organized today. Um, it just helps you feel more comfortable tomorrow because you can do this. You've worked hard. You've, I know you put a lot of effort into this year. This is, um, sorry, my, I think I'm getting emails. Let me see if I can shut that down. Um, you know, I just want you to have every opportunity to do your very best. And if you're not worrying about, um, you know, gathering things in the morning, it will make your life a lot easier. Okay, I think I've turned that off. All right. Back to this. Okay, so, you know, you, you need to know your e, where your e-ticket is. Okay, I would download it from your um, My AP account if you haven't done that. There's an exam day checklist that you were asked to print. If you're able to do that, that you should have a periodic table handy, hopefully the AP one. Possibly the formula sheet, if you really like using that original formula sheet or what we're referred to as the cheat sheet or this very detailed review sheet, a calculator, make sure devices can be able to be charged. And I put it bold in the bottom. This is what needs to be done today. Your initials, don't write your name, only your initials and your AP number, which is on your e-ticket, 
they already need to be written on the notebook paper you're going to be using or typed at the top of like your Word document. Okay. If, you know, I would go ahead and have several pieces of paper, you know, up, up to five is the maximum number of photos you could upload. Go ahead and have, you know, for question one, you know, especially if you write really largely, I would go ahead and have up to five pieces of paper ready to go with your initials and your AP number at the top. Um, number those pages. And then um, if you're typing, go ahead and have two like Word documents or whatever form you're using, like already named and, and saved and ready to go with your AP number and your initials at the top of, of that document. And I would save the documents like question one and question two. And, I, you know, I'm suggesting this was from the College Board because some letters in like Calibri and Arial and other things, like a capital I looks like a lowercase l, they want you to use, um, and I suggest Times New Roman, because capital I's look like capital I's and there was not any question as to what letter you mean. Okay, so make sure, go ahead and do that today. So that is not a detail that you need to be worrying about tomorrow. Um, Danny, anything else about just getting no, organized? Nothing I can think of. Okay. All right. Here's that exam day checklist that the College Board suggested you have by your computer. You write your AP number on it. Just reminds you what time to your test is. If there's a problem, it tells you what to do. If for some reason, um, you know, I'm suggesting you and I've heard this from someone else as well, that get your family off the Wi-Fi while you're testing, especially like Netflix or anything that's, you know, using a lot of bandwidth. Make sure that's, you know, gaming online. Make sure all that's not happening. Um, it's just going to give you a better opportunity to make sure that all your stuff's going through and everything's going as smoothly as possible. Um, if, if for some reason there was an issue and you know, you can't hit your back arrow on your browser. You're going to, if something happened and you lost, you know, your screen, you've got to hit the e-ticket. That's the only way to get into the test is to click on that e-ticket. So I just want to, that's referenced on this sheet as well. Okay. I know y'all can't read anything that says it's so tiny, but I just wanted to remind you what this looked like. This is what we're calling the cheat sheet. Um, it is excellent lots of information. Look over this today and, and know where everything is. So it's four pages. Those are the first two. And then the last two is by unit one through seven. Um, the formulas are on there. Again, just an excellent resource that could really help you if you're um, feeling unsure or not sure where to start something. All right. Well, what I thought we would do today, please, you know, ask questions. Um, I'd love for people to respond as because I'm going to kind of ask questions if you can. But what I thought we would do today is just I've taken some really common questions from over the years. And I'm kind of giving you responses to see if you can tell what's wrong with the response or what's missing. Um, anyway, so let's just jump right into this and and let's just read the question and you know have your that review sheet out that would be helpful on a calculator because if there are just a few calculations so looking at this um i'm not going to read all this to you but you know i'm looking for keywords so i have this enthalpy of solution the student has access to calorimeter hopefully that rings a bell and then it's talking about precision of instruments if we get to a to measure the enthalpy of a solution for lithium chloride, the student adds 100 grams of water initially at 15 degrees Celsius, so that's a key piece of information, to a calorimeter and adds 10 grams of lithium chloride, stirring to dissolve. After the lithium chloride dissolves completely, the maximum temperature reached by the solution is 35.6 degrees Celsius. Okay, so it's lots of information. I hear the word calorimeter. I hope you're thinking of a certain formula. Okay, so look at your formula sheet or review sheet and see if that doesn't ring a bell. I calculate the magnitude of heat absorbed by the solution during the dissolution process, assuming that the specific heat capacity of the solution is 4.18, there are the units, 
and then include units with your answer. So specific heat is a huge clue if you didn't pick up on the calorimeter. So hopefully you're thinking Q equals MC delta T. I pulled this off of the um, formula sheet, the review sheet that was given. And you know, it's things are defined here. Again, you can also use your um, other formula sheet, but we need to solve for Q, which is heat. So what do we have? Well, we have mass. So if we look at what's in the problem, we have 10 grams of water, um, excuse me, 100 grams of water and 10 grams of lithium chloride. It's like, what part of that is important? Both numbers, one of the numbers. So let me give you an example problem that was written. Is this correct? There's a 10 gram mass reported for M. We've got our specific heat, our delta T, make sure that is in the correct order, final minus initial. And I have a unit. It's been rounded to three significant figures, which is great. I have... I mean, the number has been rounded. I have the unit of joules. Is that going to get me full credit on this question? Okay. And the answer is no. That's the problem. If you look here, if a solid in red is added to the solution, the mass is the total of the two. So that's going to prevent me from getting full credit on this answer, which I know you could get that. So we're gonna look at that. And then the second question we're gonna answer, which usually comes right after a Q question, determine the value of delta H for the solution for, LIC for LICL in kilojoules per mole of reaction. So they're telling us the units we need to end up with. So here is this setup. Notice this time they do, they have obeyed that total mass. And then notice, and I'm going to give that a smiley face because I like the way that looks. And then for the next one, they've gone ahead and rounded to kill and changed the units to kilojoules. Is that necessary to answer in kilojoules? Was that a specific piece of information given? And the answer is no. I don't have to answer in kilojoules. If I have my answer in joules, I just need to make sure it's rounded. Okay, so it would be 9470 joules would be a great answer. Or I could go ahead and convert that to kilojoules. Either one is correct, and that looks great. Have they done a good job on part two, though? Determine the value of the enthalpy of the solution. And all I see is some words. So this is, you know, be careful. Read the question carefully, because a value is a numerical answer, and all I see is really good information. They're saying it's a negative delta H because the temperature increased. That is exactly right, and that is important because heat was released, so it is exothermic, but make sure you've answered the question, okay? So that's not gonna get them any points, even though I can tell they know what they're talking about. So I'm just gonna encourage you to read carefully because we do need to make a calcula calculation here. And if we go back to this formula sheet, it reminds me of what I have to do to convert heat to delta H, okay? So I've got to have a different sign because my sign for my delta H has to reflect what's going on with the heat in the from the in this case the system is releasing heat into the surroundings so I do need that negative sign but I also have to convert joules to kilojoules and I've got to divide by moles to give this molar heat of reaction so again this um, review sheet is very very helpful so here's my answer we saw earlier and then this, if we go back to this, notice we got to, we already have kilojoules. We're going to have our negative sign added to that. But we, to have this moles of reaction, it's either going to be dividing by moles of the limiting reactant or the salt that's dissolved. And it tells me what I want moles of right here, lithium chloride. So you just have to kind of pick up on that and remember. So Notice we only have 10 grams of lithium chloride. So changing grams to moles, um, I know y'all are experts at that. It's just knowing that that's what I need to do here to get that per mole of the reaction. And as you can see here, just doing that simple math and, and showing that I divided by the molar mass of the lithium chloride gets me that one point for moles. And then finishing up the problem by dividing my previous answer by that, that mole answer and having the correct signs can give me that second point. If I had messed up an A, let's say I didn't have the right mass, I could still get um, 
some credit here, but again, this is a problem that's very, very common, and I hope if this is on tomorrow's test that you're gonna use that review sheet, and I hope you're gonna get full credit for all this. And all right. sometimes, sometimes, yeah. students, sometimes students freak out when they see the word magnitude. What am I supposed yes. to do with that? And keep in mind, it's just the number. There's no sign associated. Just find the number of Q. The sign will come yes. later when you're doing delta H. Excellent, great point, yes. All right, this free response continues. And this is you know, what we're used to seeing as they switch from one um, unit to the other and one question, which you're gonna see a lot of that tomorrow. So they're talking about um, two different salts and the factors that affect, affect that enthalpy of solution. Um, and they're saying it's ionic radius and lattice enthalpy. And notice for lattice enthalpy here, this is, oops, didn't do that. Um, it's actually giving you a definition, okay? So when you're reading and you see there's a definition, just remember that. Maybe that might help you later and it might be something just to, to note. So we have this table of ionic radii and part B says write the complete electron configuration for the sodium ion in the ground state. Well, don't let ground state throw you off. That just means it's normal where the electrons are in the lowest energy possible, okay? Mm -hmm. But notice it does say ion and you have to pay close attention to that because um, I've, I've given this question a lot and grade a lot of them and this is the typically because students are in a hurry and even and they are really good at electron configuration and um, unfortunately this is what I see and so I hope you see that there's something wrong with this is that the correct answer I'm kind of telling you it's not <laughs> what's wrong with it is that the ion and it's not because the Na plus ion has lost its valence electron, which so I should not have that there. The best way to write this, if you're in a hurry and you have to just exit out because you're trying to speed through something, that's fine. It would be better to just give the answer like that with, you know, neater. Um, I tried to type that like according to the um, directions for the keyboarding shortcut. So um, make sure you practice typing according to those shortcuts, because it, it does really save you some time than trying to do superscripts and such scripts, which you're not required to do on this exam. Now, um, Lee, one, Lee, if they had yeah. typed 3S0, showing that mm -hmm. there's nothing there, would that also be okay? Yes, 3S0 is okay. Um, it, it's not ideal. The one thing that we cannot accept is if you had 3S and nothing, because 3S, with nothing after it, if you think about it, is an understood one and that would not get credit. So um, we don't, I don't really like 3S0, but it is acceptable. It, it, I would just leave it off, okay? I included this student response here because notice how they did a noble gas. They put neon in brackets and I just want to, um, well, first I wanna say this student did get full credit because they had 1S2, 2S2, 2P6. But if they had only put neon in brackets, that would never receive credit, okay? Now, what if this student had put helium in brackets, which is, you know, 1S2, and then put 2S2, 2P6, could that get credit? And the answer here is no, it would not, because notice this, it says write the complete electron configuration. So if it says complete, make sure you're starting with 1S. If it just said electron configuration, then it, we would take the um, noble gas. Okay, continuing on with this question is, um, Explain why the sodium ion, we're gonna do this one at a time, so just looking at C, explain why the sodium ion is larger than the lithium ion. And I've, I've included several, go ahead. I've included several um, student responses because I want you to see if this is what you would write and if this is okay. So it's just, just to kind of quiz you a little bit. So this says the sodium ion is larger than the lithium ion because sodium ion has more electrons and more energy levels than lithium ion has, therefore the ion has a greater size. It sounds pretty good. Is it good enough? This is the question. Because remember, we need specific answers. So I'm kind of leading you to this, and this is, 
a lot of my students have tried to write this and I really have to you know, talk to them. You can't, it's not just about more. You can't say just more. You have to be more specific, okay? So let's look at another example. The sodium ion is larger than lithium ion because it has more energy levels, which causes electron shielding and therefore increases distance between them. Is that better? They said shielding. Is it? No. No credit. <laughs> Nobody's going to respond but you. Thank you. All right. So what is going to be, what do we really have to have here? And it's got to be something about the specific information. The sodium ion has a full second energy level in addition to its first. Lithium ion only has one electron energy level. The extra shell of electrons makes the atomic radius of sodium ion much bigger. Really, that last sentence is the, the key. There's one extra energy level that's occupied occupied energy level, occupied shell, shell of electrons, one more. That's why they got full credit. Gold star. And I've also had a student take that very same question and they uh -huh. just wrote, they wrote the electron configuration for the lithium ion and uh -huh. they used that as a comparison because they had already written the one for sodium. They wrote right. the one for lithium and it was like, here, let me show you. Was there a sentence that explained it as well? Oh, yes. Yes. They went on to say, as you can see, this one has two occupied energy level and this one only has one. But I mean, they just since they had already done that part B, yeah. then they were like, or part, yeah, part B, then why not go ahead and do the one for lithium as well? That's great. As long as it's specific statement saying there's, you know, this one extra occupied energy level of electrons, I think that's excellent because that helps you figure it out if you have that information in front of you. Um, the only caution I have is students make sure you don't use the word orbital when you mean energy level because that is a way to say everything right and use one wrong word and then don't get, you won't get credit. Okay, so energy levels and shells are the same thing. They're not the same thing as orbitals. Okay, part D, which salt, and it gives us two choices, has a greater last and enthalpy. So again, when you have a choice, you've got to clearly state which one you're saying has a greater lattice enthalpy, and then give us, justify why that is true. All right, so notice here we have this ionic radii information that might be helpful. Um, and sometimes this could actually say, justify your answer based on Coulomb's law. You know, that would be a, a just another way this could be asked and you would actually be answering it exactly the same way. So remember, when you're talking about ionic compounds, um, I thought I had my formula sheet. It will, we'll get to that in a second. Th they said N NaCl has a greater lattice enthalpy due to its larger molar mass. The, um, this makes it more polarizable and therefore has stronger ionic. Okay. And once, so, why, don't we, why don't we pause for a second and just have everybody find on the cheat sheet the part about lattice energy, if they have it. That's it. Just, yeah, about all kinds of, and I've got it right here, right there. That's what you need to find. Because if I'm talking about um, IMFs, I need to have a molecule, right? And I don't have a molecule because I have NaCl, which it even says right here is, is um, ionic. All right, so there's your Coulomb's law. So let's think, how are we going to use this? And there's actually a section at the very top of this page that uses Coulomb's law again. You could refer to that as well. Okay, so back to the question, what should we say about this? Which one will have the greater? we got to make a choice. It's not about charges because Li plus and Na plus are both the same. So it must be about the other relationship and that is the distance. Okay, so let's read this one and see if we agree. LiCl has a greater lattice enthalpy because Li plus has a smaller radius and they said atomic, but we forgive that because they meant ionic, but that's okay. Meaning that Li and Cl atoms and they're being ions, but again, are closer together. See, they understand the gist of it. That's what, this is what we mean by we want to reward good chemistry. 
Okay, Li plus is smaller and it's closer to the chlorine. That's what we're looking for. Therefore, it has a greater attraction. So we're looking for that closer distance. And you have to be specific. You have to say between Li plus and Cl minus. You can't just say it's closer to. You have to say it's closer to what? Okay. So that was good. I That person kind of went into a long detail. I wanted to show you just the rubric. Oops. That was going to pop up. It, you, you can be very simple language, one sentence. Okay. So you don't have to use many, many sentences. All right. Um, the other thing I want everybody to notice is notice in every single one of these answers that she's given, they have clearly labeled what section they're answering. So if you've been taking AP English or some other things where you just write these big long essays, no one has time for that in chemistry. If you're answering part D, then skip a line, put D, and answer the question. No one wants to read this whole five paragraph essay thing. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, clearly labeling is huge. You may not get credit if things aren't clearly labeled. So, um, and then the last one, this is really quick. And again, you're not gonna have to, you know, label like a drawing, but they could put, an A and a B and say, which ion is, is A on the left, the big, bigger sphere, which one is the smaller one? And hopefully, just looking at your periodic table, I hope you would realize that it would be chloride that's larger and Li plus would be the smaller ion. <coughs> and then moving to this last one, I wanted to use this, I know Mr. Elegante has already heard to this, excuse me. <coughs> But I wanted to go through this because this sounds, in my opinion, kind of complicated. And I want to show you this is where this review sheet can really help you out that, we've, that you've been given. So notice the lattice enthalpy is positive, indicating, and you can read this as, that as well as I can, takes energy to break the ions apart. However, dissolution of LICL in water is exothermic. Identify all particle-particle interactions that contribute significant, significantly to the dissolution process being exothermic. For each interaction, include particles that interact and the specific type of intermolecular force. Wow, that sounds complicated. On your, everybody look at your review sheet. Find the section that's talking about solutions because that's the root of dissolution. Where are, is it talk about solutions forming there's actually a picture hopefully you found it and it looks like this so what part of this picture is going to help me answer this question it says dissolution is exothermic all right so that's endo endo exo the interaction between the solute and the solvent is exothermic so what do I need to say? What particles are interacting and what do we call that? Well, I'm looking under here, um, you know, these interactions are more, sim are more soluble when you have similar IMFs or ion dipole attractions. So that's all we really need to say here is we have Li plus attracted to polar water, we have Cl minus attracted to polar water, and what, we, what do we call that attraction? An ion dipole. So you can, it takes something that, sounds complicated, think, oh, that's a, making a solution, find this, that should help you go to the part that applies. Because it sounds like you're gonna, you know, really write a few paragraphs and you really don't need to, okay? Now, if you look at this one, notice the student, sound, it sounds really good, but you, you know, if you really, it says, talking about the dipole of water is attracted to the chloride, and then here's the problem, London dispersion, dipole, dipole, is anything like that? Are we talking about any of that? And then they, they correctly say negative dipole, correct, you know, attracted to Li plus. Of course, I'd rather them say partially positive and partially negative, but then they say ionic bonds. And so you can just tell they got the idea. They have the completely wrong IMF. We have to have this term ion dipole with that description. So... Oh, sorry. hold on just a second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. And I'm don't forget to, that uh, he did not like me grabbing. 
Don't forget, you can make a list of your IMFs if you need to, that, you know, ion dipole and those kinds of things, because you know one of those questions is coming up. There's going to be something like that. Yes, definitely. Okay, moving on to the well, next. Hey, could, could you pause for just a second? And yeah, sure. What y'all just saw was an entire question from like 2015 or 2016. That's a good example of a question that hits on all kinds of different topics. Was there something about that that anybody had a question about? You could either type that in the panel or unmute your microphone and ask. Was there one part of that that you were confused about? All right. I don't want to ever hear you complaining. You didn't get the chance. So, <laughs> all right. So you can go ahead on. I just wanted to check. Yeah, that's, thank you. That's extremely important. Make sure you get your questions answered. Okay. Or if there's anything related to those topics that we just talked about, type, Ms. think about it, type it in and we can answer to any point. So. Ms. Brown and I have already passed AP Chem. We know what we're yeah. doing. We want to make sure that you guys know what you're doing. All right. Okay. So then I gave you an, another question. You can tell this would have started a totally different part of the question, probably a short um, FRQ. So you've got this reaction and then notice you have some information about the reaction. You've got 2.24 grams of sodium hydrogen carbonate, 60 milliliters of a, that molarity of a acetic acid solution. And then we have bubbles forming, which is one indication a reaction has occurred. And the flask gets cooler. See, if I was writing on my test, um, or on, I would be thinking to myself, what does that mean when a flask gets cooler? That means delta H is positive. This is endothermic. It's absorbing heat from the surroundings. So, you know, that might matter later on, but just I want to, be aware that every detail might be something I need later. But if you look at A, it says just identify the reaction as acid-based precipitation or redox. So again, identify means tell me an answer, one answer, but then it also says justify. Sometimes if it just says identify, tell the answer and move on. But this says pick one of these, it's like multiple choice, and then explain why. So think, which one of these makes sense for this reaction? Okay, here's one student response. Notice they picked acid base, and then they explained why it couldn't be the other two. So what do you think? You think that's okay? It can't be precipitation because no solid formed, and it isn't redox because oxidation states don't change. It's an, it must be an acid reacting with the base to form water and a salt. Okay, and it kind of looks like that. You know, this is a, a kind of a different variation, but do you think this person got credit? Well, they did because that makes sense. You know, they, it, I, I don't think this is always the easiest way to answer a question, but sometimes, you know, that might be, make the most sense to you. I, we would love for you to say that, hey, I know this is acid based because that um, acetic acid is donating its H plus to um, Na, the hydrogen carbonate, sodium hydrogen carbonate solution or, you know, substance. And, and that, and so a don donating and gaining that H plus makes it acid base. But this person correctly said why it had to be acid base because they know what the other two had to be and they didn't fit into this category. So I just want you to see that because, um, that's a, a correct justification in kind of a roundabout way. So they did get credit. And then when you see all of this, these numbers, you should expect a math problem. <laughs> so based on the information above, identify the limiting reactant, justify your answer with calculations. So if, there, if there's any question, they're telling you, you must show calculations. You can't walk us through it in words. We must see your math. Okay, so on your review sheet, go find the stoichiometry section. Okay, 
notice I kind of covered up. This was dilution, that, that rectangle. But notice here's our molarity relationship, moles of solute per liter of solution. Here's the relationship between milliliters and liters. Notice we have a molarity but we have milliliters, which won't work. We've got to make that correction. And then when we just, you know, do some kind of stoichiometry, a lot of times we do start with masses and we divide by the molar mass, which you can see is the case here. So to get to this um, identification of a limiting reactant, we've got to take both of our reactants information that we have, two moles, and then do a mole ratio. And I teach my students we do a mole to mole ratio to the same product and compare it that way. I know there are a lot of ways to work that, but you know, I feel like you should be ready for a question like this. Okay. So let's, let's look at um, the example. So they have their milliliters. Notice they've changed it to liters, which is has to happen. And notice molarity times their liters liter volume gives moles. And then here's the key. They did their one-to-one -one mole ratio. They chose um, this um, salt as the product. And here's their answer clearly stated. Then they did their other information. They molar um, mass, excuse me, divided by molar mass. They've shown their one-to-one -one mole ratio. They have these two answers. And that because we see this such a small value for the sodium acetate, we know that the sodium hydrogen carbonate is the limiting reactant. Okay, that just, you know, notice it's not the neatest in the world, but it's neat enough to read. If you're typing, you know, you've got to um, use your parentheses and your slashes, um, but make sure you have that mole ratio, at least one over one. Okay, anything else? Well, the other thing to keep in mind is if you're running short on time, a lot of times you get points just for identifying it, even if you didn't have the calculation. So if you're at the end of your 25 minutes and you're like, oh, I never went back and did that, pick one, throw it down there. <laughs> you never know. You may or may not get the point. Yeah, that's true. Okay. And if, if you, you know, this is something we've been doing since the first year of chemistry. So... If you see that question, you're like, oh, I can do that. Do it. You know, spend a minute and, and get this done so that you can, you know, continue on with these other things that might take you a little bit longer. All right. Here's the next question of the same in the same um, overall question. The student observes that the bubbling is rapid at the beginning of the reaction and gradually slows as the reaction continues. Explain this change in the reaction rate in terms of the collisions between the reactant particles. So what causes, what about the collisions is different as the reaction goes on, and which means our bubbles are slowing down? What causes a change in rate? Find, think of information. What's important about collisions? Or what's really changing about the reaction as the reaction goes on? That's really what we need to focus on. Aren't there less reactants? Let's look at this answer. Um, at the beginning, we have a high concentration of reactants, which is more likely that a collision, and you remember the two important things about a collision are they have the right energy and the right orientation to have an actual reaction. So we have a lot of molecules with that. We have high concentration at the beginning that have that information. But as the reaction goes on, the reactants are decreasing. See, this is what they're looking for you to say. The reactants are decreasing in concentration. And really what that means is there's a smaller fraction of reactants that will be able to collide with that enough energy to cause a reaction. And that's why it's slowing down. And under, I feel kinetics, like and under kinetics on the cheat sheet, there is a thing that talks about if you increase concentration, you get more collisions. So this is just the exact opposite of that. If you drop the concentration, you're going to get less frequent collisions. Very good. So just, I feel like they're going to ask you something about 
with kinetics about, you know, collisions, effective collisions, right? It's about activation energy and it's about um, orientation. And this is how the rubric, it, it, it was pretty simple. I know that was kind of a wordy answer. Collisions between reactant particles become less likely as concentrations decrease. Okay. So less collisions, less stuff available. All right. Here is um, a question. This is kind of going to a completely different question. Um, this was the beginning of a long free response question. I chose this because I really kind of wanted to look at several things, not just what the question was asking. Okay. On this year's exam, you know, you're not going to be drawing these, um, these different substances. Okay. So I'm going to label these carbons one and two. Before we get to this question, I'm going to ask you a couple other things. First, I want you to tell me what is the molecular geometry for carbon one? What is carbon one's molecular geometry and what is carbon number two's molecular geometry? That would be my first question. Okay. So you have all those geometries are listed on the review sheet. So for carbon one, I hope you would say because there's only, there's no lone pairs. There's only a bonded atom on each side. It doesn't matter that one has connected with the triple bond. Carbon one has a linear molecular geometry. And then for carbon two, I would hope you would say that it is, see it's different. It has two bonded atoms, but now you have the presence of that third domain with the lone pair. So this is the one of the versions of bent. Okay, what else could I ask you about that? Maybe they might ask you hybridization. That could be a quick identify the hybridization for carbon one. Well, if it's linear, its hybridization is sp. If it's bent, it's sp2. Okay. Now, if we go down to the question that's actually been asked, the formal charge question, that setup is on your. Um, formula sheet, I mean the review sheet. So find that, it's in that same area of these other things. It tells you in red, formal charge is where you take valence electrons minus the number of lone electrons and minus the number of electrons it's contributed to a bond, okay? So if I notice hydrogen, I don't need to do the formal charges for hydrogen because they're the same on each one. The way you're gonna get ants, um, credit here is when you show your math for formal charges. So if I do carbon one, notice it has four valence electrons minus, it doesn't have any lone pairs of electrons, it only has electrons and bonds. So this carbon is zero. If I do carbon two, it has four valence electrons, it has a lone pair, so that's two, and then it has three in bonds, so it's going to be negative one. And then I do need to go through and do nitrogen and oxygen because I'm seeing a difference here. And we need to decide because we're asked, this is the only way we can figure out which structure is better. So if I do nitrogen, it has five valence electrons minus no lone pairs. I've got four in bonds. This, the first nitrogen is plus one. Um, I'll go ahead and finish this oxygen. Oxygen has valence electrons of six minus it's got six in lone pairs plus one in that bond. So it is negative one. Finishing this structure. I'm, I'm trying not to go too fast, but I'm sorry if I'm, I hope I'm not losing anybody. So please speak up if I am. Um, so five minus four plus one. Now I got the four from the four bonds. And then oxygen, six minus. And this, it has four lone pairs and then two in bonds. So it's four if I want to write it out, minus four, minus two, and then that would be zero. So the question is, which one of these is better? Well, you know, typically we say whichever one has um, formal charges closest to zero, but here we go. Here's the how we know which one to pick. But if any element is negative, it must be the most electronegative. Okay, so what's more like electronegative out of 
these, well, it's oxygen. So can carbon be negative one and oxygen be zero? This is saying no, that can't happen. My, this is my best structure. Why? Because this is the structure where the most electronegative element oxygen has a negative one formal charge. That's my answer. Okay. But again, you could be given some kind of Lewis structure and asked lots of different questions, maybe even a polarity question. Does anyone want to ask something about this before we um, move on? I think that was good. I think it was very, very straightforward. Okay. Okay. And then it jumps to a totally different question and we get to Delta H and I wanted to do this question because I see lots of mistakes with my students when we have a question like this. So notice we've still got these structures and it's telling us we've got this table of average bond enthalpies determine the value of Delta H for this reaction. Okay, so remember, we've got to, you know, when reactants um, go to products, reactants bonds are broken. So all these bonds, if you look at them, I draw little arrows, those bonds have got to break, and then products bonds are going to form. So the bonds that are breaking, notice if we, I'm going to circle them in the table, we've got the carbon hydrogen bond breaking. We've got a triple nitrogen carbon bond breaking, and we've got an NO single bond breaking, okay? The new bonds forming in these products are, we've got a nitrogen hydrogen bond, a carbon nitrogen bond, and a carbon double bond oxygen. So my question to you is, because I've got to add up, all of, oops, I circled the wrong color. I've got to add up the red numbers and then add up the blue numbers. This is red, this other one's blue. And here's what I get. Notice that's what I circled. How is the correct way to find delta H using bond enthalpies or bond energies? That's my question. Because there's two way, you know, there's two different formulas. There's broken minus formed. There's products minus reactants. This is what my students mix up. So which one is correct? I've got two ways to do it. Do I say, is it this way or this way? Notice I get the same numerical value. It just has a different sign. One well, would be full credit. One would probably be very little credit. According to so, the reference sheet, it's bonds broken minus bonds formed. Exactly. So we would pick, there it is from the reference sheet, broken minus forms. And we would definitely want to pick this, this one, negative. It's exothermic overall. Okay. Now, when do we use the other formula? And will y'all check and see if you see that on that review sheet? Mine had a space above the broken minus formed. Do you see it, Danny? Oh, there's a space. There used to be something there before. I think it was this. So, hey, guys, I'm telling you, write this in. Okay? So when do we use this products minus reactants? The summation of the enthalpies of formation. And so here I just found this question. Hydrogen gas burns in air. Here's the reaction. A, calculate the standard enthalpy change for the reaction represented by the equation above, and then it gives the molar enthalpy of formation, that's the symbol we're looking for to use this, okay? So look for the formation number. And, and notice, wow, I only have, you know, we could be given a table of numbers. Here I'm just given one for water. So I've got this information. Why don't I have anything for the hydrogen and the oxygen? Anybody? Well, if you'll remember, elements are zero. Okay. So is this correct is my question. And again, if I'm typing, I just, I don't have to do the symbol, just write the word delta H equals. Is that correct? Carefully look at it. Products minus reactants. I hope 
someone is thinking, you probably can guess, I keep asking the, that is not correct. What's missing? You have to use the coefficient. This is where uh, you might see a mistake and a problem like this. You've got to, that enthalpy of formation is for one mole. And in this case, we had a two coefficient. So we had to double it. And then I get my final answer. Okay, I just want to point out that um, that's an easy place to make a mistake as well. First, and using the wrong formula. And then second, once you have these formulas, don't forget to use the coefficients. Okay, um, this was a part of a longer free response question. Um, it involves some math. We've already done a little bit of math, so I just kind of wanted to get to a, a different kind of question. So it's saying here's the reaction this question was about. That was an unknown metal, okay? So because we don't have an element M, that's an unknown metal. It says this, this um, the student hypothesizes that the compound form that sent this reaction is ionic. Propose an experimental test the student could perform that could be used to support the hypothesis. Explain how the results of the test would support the hypothesis if the substance was ionic. They're saying ionic. This is a polite time to go back to that section on your review sheet that talks about ionic compounds. Look at the properties of ionic compounds. So here are two possible answers that were both correct. They said boiling point would be really high, which is true, but you know, I think um, if you look at your sheet, it, it refers to melting point. So that would be, because usually you know, ionic compounds, they are gonna be solids at room temperature. So either one of those um, would be a way to prove that this was um, ionic. They accepted that answer. And then the one I probably would have thought of was if you have a soluble ionic compound, when you put it in water, it will split into ions and it makes the solution a good conductor. Okay. So it says you could, you know, have a circuit with a light bulb. I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that. You could test the conductivity of the solution and it would be a really good conductor because it would be a strong electrolyte. Okay. So occasionally you'll be asked questions about, you know, what kind of test, find that section on the sheet to help you. And then we get into IMFs a little bit more. Um, I know we talked about this a minute ago. I'll, we can just quickly look at this. Explain why I2 is a solid and Br2 is a liquid. Okay, so that's one thing. Your explanation has to clearly reference the types and strengths of IMFs in each substance. So it's very specific about what they're looking for. So types of IMFs in each one, that's where I would start. And then how do we know which one is stronger based on the properties and what's really causing that? So we can tell solids have stronger forces holding them together. So we know that one's stronger, but as you can see, and I'm not gonna go through all that, but hopefully you said LDFs, Okay, and I really just wanted to go through when you're comparing IMFs and the substances, because all molecules have LDFs between them, if the substance, you know, especially these are both nonpolar, but the reason you've got to re reference is with more electrons, they have a more polarizable cloud. Okay, so that's why I2 is a solid, because its molecules have more electrons, a more polarizable cloud, therefore stronger LDFs. Right. And my students uh, just my students did one just like this the other day. And some common mistakes were to um, they just said London dispersion forces without saying yeah. without saying that both bromine and iodine have LDFs. And you don't Very have good. to say that they're nonpolar because it just says identify or uh, mm -hmm. yeah, should reference. That's right. Right. But my students also said. Well, because iodine has more mass, it has mm -hmm. more LDFs. And I think that is a common mistake, at least my students were making the other day. And while that's true that they do have more mass, one has nothing to do with the other. That's true. I think textbooks actually get that wrong. I think that's part of the problem. 
Okay, yeah, it's about more electrons and more polarizable cloud. Excellent. All right, quickly, we can look at this. Um, you can tell from these graphs, you should be able to, without reading anything, know that this is probably a kinetics question. Okay, so those are the three graphs. You've got a reaction, information. I've got a little bit more of that on the next slide. Temperature. Notice the question, though, for trial one. It may be surprising to you. Calculate the initial pressure in atmospheres at this temperature. Assume that, the, um, that initially all the gas present in the vessel is this. So if I go to, and it's talking about trial one, I've got to say, okay, that's the open circle. Initially, trial one is this. Well, what number is that? See, that's not a pressure. It's not telling me just to write down that number. Wow, that's actually a molarity. But notice how they, they're help, trying to help you with these units. They wrote them as moles per liter. So I need to take, because we're talking about gases, gases can have molarities or pressures, but we need to change this relationship of moles per liter to pressure. So, but think, this is a gas. What, what's an easy way to get um, information about the pressure of a gas? I hope you're thinking PV equals NRT, okay? That's what I was thinking. Good. And the reason I wanted to show you this, because it was a little different, and I didn't want it to throw you off. Notice when you write this, if we're solving for pressure, that is moles over liters. Okay, so having that number is actually, you know, those two variables together. So I just have to plug that in. That's that many moles per one liter. Now, this unit tells me which R I have to use, the 0 0.08206. Again, it's on your review sheet, on your formula sheet. My temperature is already in Kelvin. So really, this is just an exercise in realizing, wow, I've got to use peak equals NRT. And I'm going to, I know we've been doing this for a while. This person plugged in the wrong number. But if you did this correctly, you would get exactly 1.0 atmospheres. Okay. So I, I really feel like you're going to see a peak equals NRT on this exam. It's very common. I hope you do. Um, I think you'll have a really great opportunity to get full credit on that. And then if you look at, go ahead. Um, somebody asked the question, when would you use the gas constant as a conversion rather than something to plug into PV equals NRT? And I can't think of a time when you would use the R value to convert. No. From one, I, from one pressure no. to another. True. Um, I think the only time you have a choice in R values if they didn't ask you a specific unit for atmospheres, but I think you're right. I don't, I'm trying to think of, I can't really think of a time to use that as a conversion factor. Yeah. Right. So I think that if they get an R, it's pretty much always going to be plugged into PV equals NRT. Yes. And I told my students, um, just FYI, if you're using the regular formula sheet, you know, if you're having it out, mark out the first one, 8.314. We're not using that, right? Because we use that in unit nine. So just mark that out. There's not a, a time to use that now. So the really, the only two that you really could consider would be this atmosphere version, which you see on the screen, or the, the millimeter mercury or TOR, I'm not sure which, it's the same unit, 62.36, I believe. Okay, but I would mark out that first one. All right, part B, use the data plotted in the graphs to determine the order of the reaction with respect to C4H6. So here are the three graphs. Again, you know, we have the, even though you have to take such a different exam, you have the luxury of having this review sheet. So on your review sheet, you have the three graphs. It's like which graph represents from the data is linear, and this review sheet tells you the orders of all those. So if you go back, we just need to look at our, X, or excuse me, our Y axes. This is concentration, natural log of concentration, one over concentration. Which one of these looks the most linear? Well, I hope you think it's that one, okay? So the answer would be, if you look at that, what would your answer be? It would be alphabetical. Yeah. Alphabetical. Zero, order. One, 
Here one, two. It would be not first order. That one's wrong, right? Can't be first order. And and that didn't, I did want to say this. It says determine the order, but it says using the data from the graph. So you have to refer to which graph told you the answer. Okay. So even if that said the reaction is second order, that person would not receive the credit. Why is that second order? Well, it's because this plot of one over that concentration versus time was linear. Okay. So make sure if you see something like this, that you're, you tell them specifically which graph told you the answer. Okay. And then the last one on this, this was a short free response a while ago. The initial rate of the reaction trial one is this, right? Calculate the rate constant for the reaction at 625. See what you have to make the connection is you just said it was second order. So why don't you write the rate law that would, it would look like if it was second order. Okay. It says initial rate. So that is my rate. I'm solving for K. I don't know K. What am I going to plug in for concentration? What's initial at the very beginning? That's what we saw earlier. So really this was just an exercise of making that connection of the graph told you the order and the order shows you how to write the rate law and then plug in the numbers. You, it gave you this one. You had to make this connection from the beginning. And the units matter. I think this student kind of wrote, I would have written the units like this. Her units are correct. They just kind of look a little awkward. Um, does anybody want to talk about anything there? Well, the other thing that students will do is they will sometimes look at that and go, oh, well, the K should be the slope of the line. Yeah. So some of them and, may go to that graph and actually pull and actually calculate the slope of that line of that linear graph. And and that would work. Right. That's a great way to do it. Yes. Thank that. Thank you. That's great. Because that, that would be perfect. Anybody else have a question about this rate law? The last time I had a um, review, somebody asked about reading a burette. And so I included this one. So when it asks for what should the student record as the volume? Um, so you've got this initial volume and this, oops. Yeah, final volume. And it's just like a delta T. Delta, the change in volume is minus, minus, final minus initial. The problem with this is, I know y'all can read numbers, is decimal places. How do we know how precise our reading has to be? Because they're not going to tell you that's what they're testing for here. So look at the unmarked lines. We know we have this is between five and six. What does every marking represent in between that? And I can see they're 0.1 milliliters. So what that tells me is if I have any volume that would be between those two markings, I have to be more specific. So that tells me I need to estimate one place. So what you're expected to know here is, again, they took some variations of answers because you might think it's like uh, 0.14 or, you know, whatever it is, 0. you know, 0.36 or whatever. But this would not work. See, that person answered that question to um, the tenths place, and they would not get any credit. This would be a one-point question because both volumes, and again, they're going to take some variations in that last digit. Everyone should have 37.3 here. You might have thought it was 3.31, and everyone should have had 5.6. That last digit is estimated, and then you had to subtract, but it had to be to two decimal places. Okay, so if you're asked to read um, any glassware, you know, make sure you've estimated that the last digit. So, Lee, let me ask you a question, because this is something that I've done before and I know my students do. What if they uh -huh. got in a hurry and they showed the math not of 5.7 or 5.6, but instead recorded it as 6.4 and okay. the other one not as 37.3, but... 38.7. Okay. Good. 
if if they showed that mistake and yet still got the right answer of 31.7 milliliters, would that still be okay? Because they're getting the volume right, or would the fact that they made a mistake kind of cancel that out? It kind of depends on if it's one or two points. I, usually this is based on, they take a range of answers, but you have to have like the first digits correct. Do you know what I mean? Like, right. You, you can't misread the glassware. Where. Okay. Okay. So you, the answer on the rubric says 31.65. Some people might have had 31.64, 31.67. They take a range of answers, but the beginning numbers have to be correct. Okay. For, for the glassware. Yeah. So that's a good question. All right. This last one, last couple. And I do have one. Um, I just I wanted to go over some reactions. OK, so when you're told you're mixing two solutions together and there's a precipitate that's formed. You should you know, if you even if you wanted to write out the whole equation. OK. Like doing double replacement, that's sodium. Notice sodium is going to go with sulfate here. And then we're going to have copper and we can see it's copper plus two because the sulfate's negative two. And then we have hydroxide. What I want you to realize is you should know which one of these is the precipitate and which one is soluble. And the only reason you should know is because of sodium. OK, you don't have to know a lot of solubility rules. The one you need, it says, I believe, what snap on your review sheet. Sodium compounds are soluble. So this is not my precipitate, okay? My precipitate is my copper two hydro hydroxide and it's the two ions that make that as a balanced reaction. So what I gave you here are a bunch of examples of wrong answers just to see if you can pick out what's wrong, okay? So if we look at this, what's wrong? Not balanced. Look at the next one. Look how easy. You can even not miss that. That is, see, that's still wrong. It's missing its parentheses. This is what we see a lot. This will never get credit. What's wrong with that? No Those iron. Those are ions, and you have if you don't have charges, you're it's wrong. This copper has the wrong charge. Okay, here we, I've seen this before. They they have the negative and positive mixed up. The last one, those are actually the spectator ions, and then if you see at the very end, that's what you would have if you had the complete ionic equation and didn't mark out the spectator ions. Okay, so again. It's the ions that form the precipitate, the two ions that form the precipitate. This last one is a single replacement reaction. Single replacement reactions are redox reactions. So aluminum, and I'm going to write the whole thing, is added to a solution of copper to, and you know what, I'm going to change this to nitrate. Sorry, well, I guess I really shouldn't do that. Um, Dealer's choice, I think, the way. Yeah, I, I think the nitrate is one of the ones you have to know. To go with the rest of the slide, it's going to have to be chloride. But um, I think if it was on the exam, it would be um, a nitrate compound because all nitrates are soluble. Right. So if you do single replacement, this is going to be aluminum chloride and solid copper. Okay. So you're supposed to, if this was nitrate instead of chloride, you're supposed to know that this would be soluble. And see, this was soluble here because it says solution. That tells me that it's separate ions. So that's telling me that my chloride, and this is not balanced, which is terrible to leave it like that, isn't it? It's okay with me. <laughs> I wouldn't get any credit. Um, if, it's, if I leave it... Um, this is showing me that, see how the chloride's AQ on both sides? That's my spectator ion, okay? So if you look at these, these are all wrong answers, guys. See, my correct answer, this is what I'm looking for. 
you to write. And while she's writing, notice that none of these have states of matter. If they ask you to write the complete and balanced net ionic equation, they've got to be ions, it's got to be balanced, but you don't have to have states of matter in your final answer. Yes, and see, I think on this one, the chloride rule, you know, is that all chlorides are soluble except for silver, mercury, and lead. And I think on this exam, it would be nitrate because you're – that's more of a common rule that you're expected to know, okay? If you look at the second one, this is the complete ionic. See, they should be leaving out the chloride because that was my one spectator ion. I think the third one looks really good, and that's kind of what I started, was about to do, but what's wrong with the third one? Everything looks good except it's not balanced. Right. They knew what they were doing. They just got in a hurry and didn't look because it's not just that the atoms are balanced. It's the charges are balanced on both sides. OK. And then the last one, they just have it reversed. I, this is where I want to take the quick opportunity to show you. And we'll do it over here. Aluminum, an element is zero. And then this copper is two plus. So you could be asked from this what's oxidized and reduced. So remember oxidation is where it depends on which oil rig or Leo of the line says GER. Oxidation is where electrons are lost. The oxidation number goes up. So aluminum is going from zero to plus three. And then copper is going from plus two to zero. So we've got reduction for copper and going from two plus to zero going down. It's gaining electrons, so it's becoming a, a lower value. Okay. I'm not gonna, I wanted to go over just this reaction and the next part of this, which is actually a KSP problem. Um, Mr. Elegante did a great example of KSP in the last, um, with a common ion and without one in the last um, Q and A. So I'm gonna skip that part, but this is a very simple reaction. And if it's something like this is on there, I don't want you to miss it. If it says dissolving in water, all you need to do is split it up into ions that are balanced. And that is it. You do not need to write water. Dissolving, split it up into ions. You got to get that low hanging fruit on the exam, y'all. Yeah. And, and when kids haven't gotten this, that's what they're missing. Either the two that made it balance or the charges. Okay, the next question would be um, a KSP problem. Again, we've gone over that. I did want to show you one last problem and make sure you realize how to set this up. So read it, look for keywords, and I want someone, if you could, to type in. I know we've gone long. This is the last problem. I want someone to tell me what is a good setup for this problem. Yay. Yay, Noah. Good job. Keywords, right? Initial equilibrium. Find that. Excellent. So I typed in a rice table, like if you're typing your answers tomorrow, this is how I would do it. Okay. Now I've used color just to kind of make it stand out a little bit more. Obviously you're not using color, but I had these two initial concentrations, HI, I know nothing about at equilibrium, so it's a zero. Be careful on the change line. This is where it's easy to make a mistake because these are not in one-to-one -one mole ratios. So that's, that's you've got to be careful of that. We know this at equilibrium because we were told it up here. So you can either write, instead of writing plus 2x, minus x, and minus x, you can actually write in the values, or some of you like to solve that at the bottom. But 2x is 0.15, so that means half of that is my x. So when I set this up, this is the mistake I made. I mentioned at the beginning, I had it, you know, when we do equilibrium expressions, it's products of reactants, and for some reason, <laughs> I had it upside down, which is tragic. But I would take my 0.15 squared, don't forget, you know, coefficients become our exponents, divided by, 
my answers at the bottom of my equilibrium problem. You, you may not want to do your subtraction here. You could go ahead and do it earlier. That's what I would do and plug in those answers. Your final answer would be 7.2. So at equilibrium, you can tell because this is greater than one, it's favoring the product HI. All right, think of some questions. This is what I had at the end of the equilibrium. Hopefully you've already done the demo. The, the only studying I would do today is to look over that review sheet and get a good night's rest. Uh, Obtain, you asked about uh, conjugate acids and bases. Yes, under yeah. unit four, you have to be able to identify an acid and a base and just whatever the acid is becomes the conjugate base on the other side. So if you were HCl as an acid, it gives off Hs, then Cl would be the conjugate base. Cl minus. Right. Cl minus. Right. Sorry. <laughs> so they might very well ask you to identify who that is, yes. But that doesn't mean you have to calculate pH or anything like that. No. Great question. Thank you for asking that. Anybody else? Anything you've wondered? While they're thinking, I just want to tell them, uh, tell everybody just what I tell my kids every year. Um, you got you to get your cortisol levels down. You got to get your stress hormone levels down. Your glucose levels shoot way up when you're under stress and you make bad decisions. So go out there and exercise a little bit. The weather is beautiful. Get that down. Eat something in the morning. Um, eat something at lunch before you take that test, and, you, and you're just going to rock it. Trust me, you're just going to handle it like nobody's business. Yeah, y'all can do this. You can do this. Now, most of the issues that I've seen come up about people not being able to get their answers in, they're waiting too long. Um, or they never check their photo settings to make sure that they weren't the HEIC uh, version on an Apple product, but instead mm -hmm. of JPEG. Um, just uh, the copy and paste thing messes up the format. So I would stick to option two or three and just don't wait too long before you submit your answers. And even if something does go wrong, you still can retake it in June uh, June the 2nd. The only reason that you can't get a retake is if you say, I ran out of time. That's not going to be a valid reason. Most anything else, you could get the retake in June. And at the very beginning of the chat, you know, that link was posted. Um, you know, just some troubleshooting tips. You might want to check that. I just looked at it and there were some... Um, just it gave you some tips on what your browser needed to be. A couple of my students were using iPads and it just told them they had to have the, I think it was iOS 12 or 13. Um, that's something you can look at today uh, and not, you know, have issues tomorrow. Okay. So please click on that link. It would, it would be to your benefit just to kind of peruse what all the de details are. All right, Noah had a question. What do you think, um, Danny? Oh, sorry, I didn't see it. It says, what do you think right. is imperative that I go over before tomorrow? In all honesty, I wouldn't go over anything. I mean, if you don't know it by now, then maybe uh, maybe what you do know it is you think, what part about what Ms. Brown did today, what part of the question did I feel the most nervous about like I didn't know what was going on? Maybe you pick that one area and you look at that. And, you know, I really suggest for my students, look at that review sheet and just know where stuff is, you know, because you don't have time to search, right? You need to be familiar. If you want to use that, you need to be familiar with it. Anybody else? Uh, what do you mean by conjugate reaction? You mean like a conjugate base, Megan? Oh, I did 
didn't see that. Sorry. No, it just popped up. Um, okay. So um, acid base, I can't think of a time when you see uh, diatomic atoms. Yeah, I think when I see diatomic in a reaction, I think of redox. Just remember diatomic molecules have an oxidation number of zero, you know, like Cl2, O2, N2, H2. Those are elements. That's that's kind of what I see diatomic in reaction, and that's what I think of. Okay. Y'all have been right, so impressed. Y'all, y'all just just try your best. That's all you can do. Just the fact that you've hung on since uh, late March to be this long, having to learn some of this stuff on your own. I'm very proud of y'all. And I know mm -hmm. you're going to be great. Yes. Thank you so much for all of your effort. All right. I'm out. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys. All right. Bye. Good luck. Bye. Bye. Good luck, everybody. <laughs>